Hello, I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. This is the sixth lecture in this series on mechanical ventilation, and the topic is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Here are the learning objectives of this lecture. First, to understand the indications and the contraindications for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Second, to understand the difference between CPAP and BPAP, as well as no typical starting settings for each. Finally, to be familiar with some of the scientific evidence supporting the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in specific situations. So what is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, usually abbreviated NPPV? NPPV is a means to support failing respiratory function by delivering oxygen-enriched gas under pressure without requiring endotracheal intubation. It is best used as a short-term strategy to buy time for medical therapy to treat rapidly reversible causes of respiratory failure. These are some typical masks that can be used to deliver NPPV. Because the positive pressure can leak out if there isn't a tight seal between the mask and the skin, the masks must be worn very tightly with straps wrapping around the back of the head. Between these three options, the nasal mask is the best tolerated by the patient, but the face masks have physiologic advantages. For example, with the nasal mask, pressure can escape via the mouth in patients who are mouth breathers by habit. In addition, the nasal passages are relatively narrow and add significant amounts of resistance to airflow above that from the trachea and bronchial tree alone. However, the risk of aspiration may be diminished with a nasal mask compared to face masks. Here's an example of an unusual means to deliver NPPV. This helmet was designed within the last several years. It actually allows patients to talk, read, and drink through a straw. It is reportedly the most physically comfortable option for patients. However, it is also extremely loud. Here's a typical machine that can provide NPPV. This specific model is the BiPAP Vision produced by Philips Respironics and is one of the most popular non-invasive positive pressure ventilators in the United States. NPPV can also be delivered by most full ventilators. Doing so provides the advantage of additional options and provides better monitoring. However, some hospitals may have policies in place restricting use of full ventilators in acutely ill patients to only in the ICU even if eventual intubation is not expected. There are a number of benefits of NPPV over traditional invasive mechanical ventilation. It avoids the potential for trauma secondary to endotracheal intubation, such as vocal cord injury. It avoids the need for sedation. It allows the patient to maintain the ability to communicate. It allows for intermittent eating and drinking if the mask can be briefly removed and if the aspiration risk is felt to be sufficiently low. Finally, it avoids the risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia. There are also a number of contraindications to NPPV. In other words, situations in which the patient should be intubated and invasively ventilated. Cardiac or respiratory arrest, hemodynamic or arrhythmic instability, facial trauma or deformity, severe upper GI bleed, severe encephalopathy, an inability to cooperate, protect the airway, or sec clear secretions, upper airway obstruction, and finally, high aspiration risk. The two major options of non-invasive positive pressure are CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, and BPAP, which stands for Bi-Level Positive Airway Pressure. We'll see what the differences are between these two options in a minute. Although most other modes of ventilation, which will be discussed in Lecture 7, can also be delivered non-invasively. I've observed this is rarely done in my experience. You will likely become a bit confused by the terminology used when discussing non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. I would want to spend a minute clarifying two potential sources of confusion. First, you should be aware that some sources do not include CPAP under the general heading of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and only use the term NPPV to refer to modes of ventilation which provide additional positive pressure during inspiration. While the physiologic effects of CPAP and BPAP may be quite distinct from one another, 
I personally believe that it makes more sense to group them together here as they use the same equipment, have similar risks, benefits, and contraindications, and are considered in the same general type of patient. A second potential source of confusion is regarding the term BiPAP. Unless you have absolutely no prior familiarity with this topic, you probably paused for a moment when I listed the major options of NPPV as CPAP or BPAP instead of CPAP or BiPAP. Despite the term BiPAP being ubiquitously used to describe a general mode of ventilation, the term BPAP is technically the correct one. What's the difference? BiPAP with a little i and BiPAP with a big i are both specific types of BPAP delivered by specific ventilator models produced by individual corporations. To further confuse you, a minority of clinicians but a significant number of scientific papers use the term BPAP and NPPV fully synonymously. When in doubt, it's always best to describe the details of whatever mode of vent support you wish to provide to prevent miscommunication on account of terminology. To better understand the mechanics of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, let's first take a closer look at what occurs during normal, spontaneous, unassisted breathing. Here is a tracing of intraalveolar pressure relative to atmospheric pressure as a function of time. During inspiration, the diaphragm descends, decreasing intraalveolar pressure. Whenever intraalveolar pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure, the gradient between the two drives air into the lungs. Then, as the diaphragm relaxes and ascends, the intraalveolar pressure increases above atmospheric, generating a pressure gradient which drives air back out again. In CPAP ventilation, a continuous, unchanging positive pressure is applied to the airways by means of the masks seen earlier. This has a consequence of moving the intraalveolar pressure versus time curve up by approximately the same degree as the value of the extrinsically applied pressure. However, the mechanics of breathing are otherwise left relatively unchanged. The continuous positive airway pressure acts similarly to positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, which is an important ventilator setting. I'm using the approximately equal sign here not to express mathematical equivalence as much as conceptual equivalence. A more complete discussion of the consequences of PEEP will occur in lectures 7 and 8. For now, be aware that CPAP maintains alveolar recruitment by preventing their collapse and can improve intrapulmonary shunting. For these reasons, CPAP is predominantly helpful at improving oxygenation. Therefore, it is indicated strictly for pure hypoxic failure as might be seen with heart failure. CPAP also has more mechanical benefits in heart failure by reducing afterload through a reduction in the transmural pressure across the wall of the heart. This effect will also be discussed more in lectures 8 and 11. BPAP is significantly different. With BPAP, there are two different pressures applied. One is the IPAP, or inspiratory positive airway pressure. The other is EPAP, or expiratory positive airway pressure. Here's a tracing of intraalveolar pressure as a function of time for BPAP. The patient triggers an inspiration by a sudden downward deflection in the airway pressure caused by contraction of the diaphragm. When the machine senses this, it delivers positive pressure equal to the IPAP. Since the IPAP is higher than the intraalveolar pressure, air flows inward supporting the lung's ventilatory function. As the intraalveolar pressure approaches IPAP, airflow drops. Expiration may be triggered either by the machine sensing the flow dropping below a certain threshold, by the passage of a predetermined length of time, or by the patient's voluntary control. During expiration, the intraalveolar pressure asymptotically approaches EPAP. In the general sense, the EPAP applied during expiration in BPAP ventilation functions just like CPAP, which also functions like PEEP, that is, it improves oxygenation. Ventilation is impacted by the difference between IPAP and EPAP, so that the greater the difference between the two values, the greater the patient's tidal volume. This difference between IPAP and EPAP is essentially equivalent to the pressure support, which is an important ventilator setting also be to be discussed in more detail in lectures 7 and 8. Once again, I'm using the approximately equal sign here to express conceptual equivalence, not necessarily mathematical equivalence. Because the difference between IPAP and EPAP can affect tidal volume and thus alveolar ventilation, BPAP is indicated for hypercapnic respiratory failure 
where ventilation is the primary problem. Because BPAP also includes expiratory pressure, it is also helpful for oxygenation and therefore is indicated in mixed hypoxic and hypercapnic respiratory failure as well. Unlike with CPAP, some machines that deliver BPAP can also provide what's known as a backup rate, whereby the machine itself will initiate an inspiration if a certain period of time has elapsed without a patient triggered breath. A BPAP mode with a backup rate is sometimes referred to as ST mode for spontaneous or timed. This is to distinguish it from S mode or spontaneous only mode, where inspiration can only be triggered by the patient and not the machine. So here's a summary of CPAP and BPAP. CPAP consists of a single positive pressure that is continuous throughout both phases of respiration. A typical starting setting is five centimeters of water and is typically titrated upwards as high as 12 centimeters until either patient intolerance occurs or O2 saturation is above 90% on inspired oxygen of 60% or less. The reason to start with a relatively low setting for CPAP and for BPAP as well for that matter, uh, isn't just to prevent physiologic complication. It also provides some time for the patient to adjust to the additional support. Breathing with positive pressure feels very unnatural at first, and when combined with the claustrophobia induced by the tight-fitting mask, patient intolerance can be a significant problem. As mentioned previously, CPAP is indicated for isolated hypoxic failure. In contrast to CPAP, BPAP consists of two different levels of positive pressure, with a higher level occurring during inspiration. A typical value would be, uh, to start at would be 10 over 5, where 10 refers to the IPAP and 5 refers to the EPAP. This is titrated upwards as high as about 20 over 12 or so, uh, until tidal volume, minute ventilation, and or arterial CO2 tension have reached desired goals, uh, or until patient discomfort develops. BPAP is indicated for either isolated hypercapnic failure or mixed hypoxic and hypercapnic failure. Now I'm going to switch gears a bit and touch upon the evidence in the literature for using NPPV. First, let's talk about CHF, or slightly more specifically, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There was a 2006 meta-analysis of 17 studies comparing CPAP and or BPAP to standard therapy or each other. Here's a summary of the effect CPAP had on overall mortality based on 10 individual trials presented as absolute risk differences. As you can see, while seven of the 10 trials showed no statistically significant effect on mortality, when the data from all 10 trials are pooled together, mortality was improved by 13% with CPAP, an improvement that was statistically significant. In other words, this improvement was unlikely to be due to chance alone. When it came to the effect on the need for intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation, CPAP reduced this by 22% over standard medical care, also statistically significant. There had previously been concern that CPAP might increase risk of myocardial ischemia when used during acute exacerbations of CHF, but this meta-analysis demonstrated that this did not occur. When it came to BPAP and CHF, there was a statistically non-significant 7% reduction in mortality. And there was a significant 18% reduction in the need for intubation. So what's the bottom line? In treatment of acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, use of CPAP is superior to use of BPAP, which is probably superior to standard medical care alone. There are some people who believe that patients with CHF who present with concurrent hypercapnia comprise a specific subgroup which would benefit more from BPAP than CPAP. While this makes sense based on physiology, there is only limited evidence supporting that hypothesis as of now. What about BPAP and COPD? In 2008, CHEST published a meta-analysis of 14 studies involving 979 patients in which patients presenting with COPD exacerbations who did not need emergent intubation at outset were randomized to BPAP versus standard care. BPAP reduced the risk of eventually requiring intubation. It reduced in-hospital mortality from all causes. And it reduced hospital length of stay by almost two days per patient. You could say that the impact of BPAP on COPD exacerbations 
is quite dramatic. I apologize that this graph may seem excessively busy and may be illegible depending upon the video resolution. However, essentially what it just demonstrates is that the reduction in risk of intubation was closely related to initial arterial pH. In other words, if the initial arterial pH was normal, there was no benefit from BPAP. But the benefit was more pronounced the lower the pH was. The authors of the study didn't provide a specific cutoff, but from eyeballing the graph, it appears to be about 7.35, in other words, the lower limit of normal. So what's the bottom line in COPD? BPAP improves risk of intubation, survival, and hospital stay. The greatest benefit is seen with the lowest initial arterial pH. There are four more important indications for NPPV of which you should be aware, but which will not be discussed in detail at this specific point. First, use of NPPV in the ICU has been associated with improved outcomes in certain populations of immune compromised patients, presumably due to decreased risk of ventilator associated pneumonia. NPPV is also used to facilitate extubation in some patients in order to limit the need for emergent reintubation. This is most commonly done during treatment for COPD exacerbations and will be discussed more in lecture 10, discontinuing mechanical ventilation. Finally, nocturnal NPPV is standard of care in the chronic treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and obesity hypoventilation syndrome, along with advanced neuromuscular diseases such as ALS. A discussion of these indications falls outside the scope of this lecture series, which is focused on positive pressure ventilation in the management of acute respiratory failure only. I hope you have found this lecture on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation to be both interesting and useful. Please continue to lecture seven on ventilator modes. Thank you.